What is, or rather, what are social facts? The elementary social acts, and what is their distinctive character? The elementary social fact is the communication or the modification of a state of consciousness by the action of one human being upon another. Not everything that members of the society do is sociological. To breathe, digest, blink one's eyes, move one's legs automatically, look absently at the scenery, or cry out inadvertently. There is nothing social about such acts. But to talk to someone, pray to an idol, weave a piece of clothing, cut down a tree, stab an enemy, sculpt a piece of stone. Those are social acts, for it is only the social man who would act in this way. Without the example of the other man, he has voluntarily or involuntarily copied since the cradle, he would not act thus. The common characteristic of social acts, indeed, is to be imitative. Here is then a character that is clear-cut and what is more, objective. This is purely psychological as an explanation of social facts. It misses completely what is specific, that is social, about them. Whatever the value of this intermental psychology, why should it exercise a sort of guiding action on the specific disciplines of which it should in fact be the product? Between psychology and sociology, there is the same break in continuity as there is between biology and the physical sciences. This is why Every time a social phenomenon is directly explained by a psychological phenomenon, we may rest assured that the explanation is false. At first glance, one cannot make sense of this. But once initiated into the doctrine of the author, here is what it means. It is not the more or less of generalization of imitative propagation of a fact which constitutes its more or less social character. It is the more or less of coercivity. Indeed, according to my opponent, for by this point we have merely uncovered the half of his thought, the definition of the social fact is double. One of its characters, as we know, is again, I quote, that it exists independently of its individual expressions, end of quote. But there is another character, no less important, which is to be coercive. <laughs> Wait a minute. We must delineate in a precise fashion the exact field of sociology. It embraces one single, well-defined group of phenomena. A social fact is identifiable through the power of external coercion, which it exerts or is capable of exerting upon individuals. The presence of this power is recognizable. It is recognizable either because the existence of some predetermined sanction or through the resistance that the fact opposes to any individual action that seems to threaten it. Of course, a social fact can also be defined by ascertaining how widespread it is within the group. But one must be careful to add a second essential characteristic. A social fact exists independently of the particular forms that it may assume in the process of spreading. In fact, the second definition is simply another definition, another formulation of the first one. If a mode of behavior that exists outside the cons consciousness of individuals becomes general, it can only do so by exerting pressure upon them. That is what social phenomena are when stripped of all 
extraneous elements. As to their private manifestations, these indeed, they have something social about them, but they are not phenomena that are in a strict sense sociological. They depend on both domains at the same time, and if you like, why not call them socio-psychological? By this definition, nothing would be more social than the relationship established between victors and vanquished through the invasion of a stronghold of the fall into slavery of a conquered nation. Nor would anything be less social than the spontaneous conversion of a whole population to a new religion or a new political faith preached by enthusiastic apostles. The mistake here is so noticeable to my mind that one is forced to wonder how it could have been born and taken root in such a powerful intelligence. Mr. Duquesne tells us, given that the social fact is essentially external to the individual, it cannot infiltrate the individual without imposing itself. I fail to see the validity of this inference. Of course, of course. Of course, the distinction between the social and individual does not always present itself with equal clarity. At first sight, certain social facts seem, seem, seem inseparable from the forms they assume in individual cases. Yet statistics allow us a means of isolating them. For example, certain currents of opinion whose intensity varies according to the time and country in which they occur, may impel us towards marriage or suicide, towards higher or lower birth rates. Such currents are what I call social facts. Oh, if one depends upon statistics as an essentially objective source of information, one is deluding, deluding oneself. The records of this Sibyl are often ambiguous and in need of interpretation. In truth, official statistics function as yet too imperfectly and have functioned for too short a time to bring any conclusive factors to the debate that concern us. I know this all the better since it is I, Mr. Durkheim, who provided you at your request with the statistics of the of the office I led and which have contributed to your opus on suicide. Insofar as it is a socializing agent, imitation must of necessity exist before the society it prepares. Certainly no single act of imitation of one living being by another can suffice to associate them, any more than a single hair can form a head of hair. But by beginning to imitate a being who is capable, in turn, of imitating you, you begin to enter into socializing relations with him, which will necessarily become social relations if the acts of imitation are multiplied and centralized. No. Imitation is a purely psychological phenomenon. This appears clearly since imitation may occur between individuals connected by no social bond. And this is indeed what I show in the book you mentioned. A man may imitate another with no link of either one with the other or with a common group on which both depend. The imitative function, when exercised, has in itself no power to form a bond between them. It unfailingly has this power. And I would add, it only has this power, as long as it is an imitative propagation of psychological facts. For I have always explained that imitation, as I use the word, is a communication from soul to soul. Yes, but, yes, but, the actors of this imitative propagation need have no intellectual 
or moral community between them, nor exchange services, nor even speak the same language. And they are not any more related after the transfer than they were before. It follows that for you, the mark of a social link is the existence of an intellectual or moral community between men, or at least that they speak the same language. And would Mr. Durkheim be so kind as to tell us how, other than by the diffusion and accumulation of examples, this intellectual community or this moral community could have emerged? Would you tell us how the individuals of a nation find themselves speaking the same language, if not by means of an imitative transmission from parents to children and amongst contemporaries? Well, our methods of imitating human beings is the same method we use in reproducing natural sounds, or the shape of things, or the movement of non-human beings. It originates from certain qualities of our representational life that are not based upon any collective influence. Thus, if imitation were shown to help in, determine, in determining, for example, the suicide rate, this would depend directly, either in whole or in part, upon individual cases. This I deny. However important imitation may be to the phenomenon of suicide, and as you yourself cannot deny, a very great number of suicides are explained in this way, even by your own evidently narrow and exceedingly limited definition of the word. Imitation plays an infinitely greater role in the formation and propagation of languages, of religions, of arts. Thus, I cannot accept as in any way decisive the experiment which you presume to conduct. To make a long story short, while the contagion of suicide from individual to individual can be ascertained, imitation never seems to be able to affect the social suicide rate. Imitation may give rise to more or less numerous individual cases, but it does not contribute to the unequal tendency to self-destruction in different societies or in smaller social groups within each society. A mysterious claim indeed. If by this you mean that the collective inclination exists above and apart from all of the individual inclination to suicide, that is pure myth. If you merely mean that for each particular individual, the inclination he feels to suicide proceeds from the inclination specific to the set of other individuals who wish to kill themselves, this is a mark of agreement with my theory of imitation. It seems that this latter meaning is right. Therefore, you, Mr. Ducombe, are my pupil without knowing it. A thought which is to be found in the consciousness of each individual, and the movement which is repeated by all individuals are not, only for that reason, social facts. Social facts are far from being constituted by repetition. What constitutes a social fact is a belief, tendency, or practice of the group taken collectively. A social fact is something else entirely from the form it may assume when it is refracted through individuals. How could it be refracted before existing? And how could it exist? Let us speak intelligibly outside of all individuals. The truth is that a social thing, whatever it might be, devolves and passes on not from the social group collectively to the individual, but rather from one individual to another individual, and that in the passage of one mind into another mind, it is refracted. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs>